this is Danny Gathon for seconds out in Manchester at the famous Champ Champs gym ahead of Franchon Cruz to turn versus Savannah Marshall. I'm here with, I suppose you're the main man in this gym now, uh, lovely spot, Joe Gallagher. Uh, Joe, fantastic gym you've got here, steeped in history and has served as a last minute saviour for the open workout today. Yeah, I know this in the gym, this never knows the story of the gym, built from the 81 riots. Uh, Phil Martin did a fantastic job. His legacy still continues, that's what we're trying to do. Morris Core, Ensley Bing and they've all kept it going over the years. Bosside ABC is still going, but there was no pros um, coming out of the gym last year when they did the documentary. Um, I boxed here in 87, I coached here in the early 90s and I just wanted to come back, so I brought the stable of fighters back and that was sent to Sugar Hill, showing him around the gymnasium there. This was known as the UK Cronk years ago and um, with the gold shorts as well. And uh, yeah, we're back and uh, we're looking forward to carrying on Phil Martin's legacy. Yeah, carrying it on in great fashion and no one sort of carrying that legacy and that light for this gym better than Natasha Jonas. Obviously fights on Saturday night is cool main opportunity to become a two-weight world champion. Uh, in terms of world title fights, I feel like this one came up at sort of relatively short notice. Just from your point of view, how, how did this opportunity come about for Natasha? Well, Tasha was due to fight in March this year, then it was put back a couple of months, it was to be April. So she's been in the gym all year, she's training. We got wind of who it might be. We adjusted, we got the right sparring in. And Natasha, I said in an interview this week, I wish I could train 12 Natasha's uh, dedication, a desire, um, a motivation, and her own, her own levels of what she wants to achieve is still burning brightly. So, um, yeah, listen, Candy Wyatt, she beat Kirsty Babington last time over here. She's got a new team with her. She gave a good performance against Jesse McCaskill, stopped on her feet, wasn't hurt or troubled at all in any other fight. And she throws a good right hand left hook. Um, you've seen there today, she's punching the pads quite hard. We've got to be switched on Saturday night. Uh, there has been a bit of criticism, not obviously of the fight because it's a world title opportunity, but just of, of like Candy Wyatt in terms of the level of world champions. But I suppose Natasha's not achieved what she has and you haven't achieved what you have by overlooking opponents. Yeah, no, no listen, Natasha, Obviously, she's been with Terry Harper, Katie Taylor now. She, she's, she's, she's been in that world title fights at that level such a long time now. Um, she has the mentality. And Candy White, it's a huge opportunity for her. She could be the Canadian Natasha Jonas, do you understand? This is her opportunity. Um, she's coming well prepared, looks it, and we've got to make sure we win on Saturday night and she's got to be switched on as though she was fighting a, a Katie or a Clarissa. Uh, as I say, you obviously won't be overlooking Candy, but... This is Natasha's opportunity to be a world champion down at Walterweight. She's got three of the belts up at Super Walter. Where do you see her future as a trainer? Do you see it at 154, where she's got three of the world titles, or maybe pursuing more fights down at 147 pounds? Well, listen, Natasha's 154, 147, 140, 135. Natasha will do that, them type of weights. Um, listen, we've got to get Saturday night out of the way, and then we'll sit down after that and decide what we want to do. I think Natasha's achieved it all. There's nothing much more for her to do. She's got to make sure that she wins Saturday night, become a two-weight world champion, go away, enjoy a holiday with a little one, and then when she comes back, we'll, we'll sit down and talk about what the next move, move may be. I'm sure you're probably sick of being asked about it, but I've got to bring up Terry Harper, obviously got the, the last remaining title that Natasha doesn't have up at 154. I watched Eddie Hearn, and he was saying that yourself and Boxer and Natasha are, are letting the ego rule business since by, by not making that fight. Just what's your response to that? That's a bit rich talking about egos from Eddie, isn't it? But um, no, listen, Natasha Jonas, we're in the Natasha Jonas business. Um, they had an opportunity to give Tasha a rematch and they never made it. Tasha's on her path. Undisputed doesn't mean anything. She's unified, she's got the belt, she's got world champion. All Undisputed has to do, like Spencer, is you end up paying 3% more for another governing body. So Natasha's at the number one in the division. She's fighting at welterweight now and then we'll see after that. The fight that was sort of heavily mentioned for Natasha around the start of this year was a potential fight with Clarissa Shields. Uh, Johnny Nelson's told me she's going to be there on Saturday. Is that still a fight that's on your radar? I know it obviously wouldn't be at Walter, but it's probably potentially the biggest fight in women's boxing. Yeah, there was talk, there was negotiations. We got quite far down the line with it, um, but it never happened. Maybe, like I say, after this weekend we can sit down, but we wouldn't rule it out. No, Clarissa Shields, I think she's a phenomenal fighter. I'm a huge admirer of her and... Um, Listen, if that's an opportunity for that fight to be made, we'd make it at 154. Just a couple of things I want to pick your brain on away from Saturday night, Joe. Uh, feels like the heavyweight division's almost the only thing that's sort of stopping this boom for boxing at the minute. There's big fights happening in the women's sport and the lower weights. Uh, the sort of main talking point at the minute is this potential rematch between uh, Dillian White and Anthony Joshua. 
Just what's your thoughts on the, the rematch clause that's, according to Dillian, holding up him from signing the fight when, you know, it's not a world title fight. Josh is sort of at a similar stand in the white, some would argue, and yet Dillian's still expected to, to sign a rematch clause or agree to a rematch clause. Listen, it's, it's a fight that's not, I, me personally, I don't think many people want to watch anyway. Like Barry McGuigan said, I'm just like, who wants to tune in and watch that? The fought twice before it was going to be, it's like, who wants to see that? And I think Eddie's most really thinking he knows himself. That's not got to sell this and not sell that. Dylan's pushing for the rematch, pushing for the fight. Um, but yeah, it's like, no disrespect, Dylan, Derek, they've been great servants for sport, of British boxing, they've got everything else, but time's moving on now and you've got the likes of Jared Anderson and all them, Yuri Fiore, all them type of boys all beginning to come through and that they want their opportunities now, so they, they need to move on. Feels like rematch clauses and purse splits are just constantly stopping big fights? No, the rematch clauses, listen, when you're a mandatory, there shouldn't be a rematch clause. That's the idea of a mandatory. But for another situation, let's just go back to how it was. If it's a good fight and the public demand it, then we'll do it again. But you're getting caught in a, a situation of doing a rematch sometimes and fights and they're holding up divisions and you got a rematch and it's like, well, who really wants to see that again? It's just have to fight. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. That's it, move on. Like, do you know what I mean? We're, we're getting held back a little bit. We've got to move forward with the next generation now. 100%. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, Joe, another topic alongside the heavyweights that's always mentioned is this potential Conor Ben chris Eubank Jr. fight. The, the latest we're hearing is that they, they'll play ahead with it in Abu Dhabi, even if Conor's UCAS situation isn't resolved. Uh, just your thoughts on that and the message it sends out to boxing and the sort of the, the sort of shadow it casts over drug testing in the sport? Well, listen, as far as I am understand, I don't think anything's been proven yet. Um, as far as um, Conor Ben being the same, we've got news and there's a fight. The British Border Control, um, Chris Eubank Jr. is licensed by them, Eddie Hearn's licensed by them. And if they're of any involvement in putting a fight together without their sanctioning, I'm sure they'll be pulled before it. Conor Ben hasn't been before the board yet. And I feel if he is found guilty, then he has to serve his time. You look at Liam Cameron, who got four years for cocaine, minor use traces in it, and you can't just run that over. So it's, um, yeah, you just can't do that. And, and if it has happened, it just shows you that power and money has won again. So is that your understanding that any British Boxing Border Control license holder who was involved with a fight involving Connor abroad, if, he, if his case with UCAD was still pending, would be in risk of losing their license? Yeah, that's how I, how, I, how I understand it, yeah, because they have to be sanctioned by the board and given um, uh, their approval to go and fight abroad. I've just had Paul Butler, they say, send you the paperwork, yes, we allow you to box, medicals are up to date and everything else, and you're representing the British Boxing Board of Control, so that's it, yeah. Joe, you give me plenty of your time there, very grateful. Uh, all the best for yourself in the class on Saturday. I hope you enjoy Champs Camp while you're here.